Hello and welcome to this year's uh, Sparta Live webinar series. Γεια σας, καλώς ορίσατε στη νέα σειρά Sparta Live webinars. I'm Chrysanthi Gallu, Associate Professor of Aegean Archaeology at the University of Nottingham and Director of the University's Center for Spartan and Peloponnesian Studies. It is our great pleasure to welcome you back to the series and also that we continue co-hosting the series with the city of Sparty, represented by my co-host, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Petros Dukas. He will be joining us probably a bit later because we had some technical issues with his connection. Before I give the floor to my co-host to introduce today's uh, speaker, or I'll do it if he cannot join, we would like to pay tribute to a great lady and a dear friend and sponsor of the center, Mati Igun Xilas, who passed away last week. Mati has been a major philanthropic benefactor in the UK and in Greece. She was mainly brought up and educated in England, but was passionate about her homeland's cultural heritage. One of her great successes was the foundation of the Greek Archaeological Committee UK in 1992, an organization dedicated to informing academics and the public in Britain of the archaeological work uh, carried out in Greece and to enabling the brightest young minds, as she had put it, of Greece and Cyprus to pursue postgraduate research at British institutions to the mutual um, enrichment of both. Some 70 graduates have so far benefited from the scholarships and support of GAC UK, including yours truly. Almost half the scholars group are now successfully in employment at universities and research institutions in the UK, uh, Greece, Cyprus and the USA, with rather fewer working in uh, museums and in the Greek archaeological service. For me personally, Mati was a role model and a constant source of support and inspiration since the very beginning of my doctoral studies at Nottingham. I owe her definitely a great deal. With her husband, the painter Nicholas Egon, she was a sponsor and supporter of the Center for Spartan and Peloponnesian Studies too. She will be greatly missed by all her friends and mentees. Uh, farewell, uh, Mati, and may God rest her soul in peace. So we would like now to uh, introduce uh, today's um, speaker <clears throat> and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Baylis from the University of Birmingham <clears throat> who will be talking to us about the fascinating and unusual topic of Spartan anger and the stereotypes around Spartan behavior. Andrew is a senior lecturer in Greek history at the University of Birmingham and a former postdoctoral fellow here at the University of Nottingham. According to his university webpage bio, he has been obsessed with ancient history since he learned about the last stand of the 300s at Thermopylae when he was only 12. He studied ancient history for his BA at Macquarie University in Australia, stayed on there for his PhD before he had the opportunity to further his research at the British School at Athens. After moving to the UK, he worked at the then Department of Classics at uh, uh, Nottingham before getting his permanent academic post at the University of Birmingham. He has published extensively on Spartan and Athenian history, including Oath and State in Ancient Greece in 2012, co-authored with uh, Professor Alan Sommerstein uh, from Nottingham. He has also completed commentaries on the fragments of the lost Spartan authors, including Titeus and Susibius for Brill's New Jacobi Online, and is currently working on a database of ancient references to Spartan emotions, actions and attitudes. A few uh, months ago, Oxford University Press published his book, The Spartans, a book that reveals the best and the worst of the Spartans, separating myth and reality. Exactly a book that we all need. In, uh, Mail, Day, uh, in uh, uh, Mail Online, Christopher Hart wrote that this book is, and I quote, a new history of these extraordinary and often terrifying people, which is both scholarly and highly entertaining. And in Classics for All, David Stoddard uh, recommended that anyone interested in Sparta should read it and every school library should own it. So, Andrea, uh, welcome to Sparta Live. The stage is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chrysanthi, for the invitation to speak to you tonight. And uh, thank you to Medukas also for co-hosting the event tonight. 
Uh, and thank you to the audience uh, for joining us this evening. Kamispera um, sas kiries kakiri. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be able to talk to you this evening about Sparta and to be part of the Sparta Live program. Now, as Chrysanthi has said, my current research is focused on Spartan behaviour. Uh, around other things that I'm working on right now, I'm currently trawling through sources for Sparta from the 7th century BCE through to the Byzantine period to find all the accounts of Spartans acting, thinking, feeling, and gathering it together into what will one day be a searchable database. What I ultimately want to be able to do is to interrogate this data in different ways. Obviously, I want to look for recurring behaviours and practices of the Spartans. But ultimately, I want to be able to look for differences in how the Spartans are presented over time. For example, to see whether later sources like Plutarch provide a very different vision of Spartan behaviour to earlier sources like Herodotus or Thucydides. But I'm a long way from being able to do that right now. So tonight, I want to talk to you about some of my early impressions based on some of the data that I've gathered so far. Now, it probably won't come as a surprise to many people in this audience this evening that a common theme in our sources for Spartan behaviour is bravery. Uh, the references to Spartans showing bravery or being expected to show bravery start with the fragments of Tateus's poetry, most obviously in fragment 11, which begins, come take courage, moves on to tell Spartans to not fear and ends by urging them to stand fast in combat. Spartan bravery is a recurrent theme in Herodotus's work, but perhaps the best example is Book 7, 104, where Demaratus informs Xerxes bluntly that the Spartans are the bravest men on earth. We could also think of Thucydides 184, where the Spartan king Archidamus tells the Spartans, we are warlike and we honour bravery. There are numerous references to Spartan bravery in Plato, Aristotle and other sources. Later sources like Plutarch also focus on bravery, but sometimes they insert bravery into a context where the earlier sources do not have it. For example, in his Life of Lycurgus, chapter 12, Plutarch claims that Spartans had to walk home from the messes at night without a torch so that they would learn to be brave, whereas the ultimate source for that story, Xenophon, makes no mention of bravery. Nonetheless, the sheer number of examples from across all the time periods suggests that the notion that Spartans were expected to be brave is no mere stereotype. Another unsurprising recurrence uh, in terms of expectations of Spartan behaviour is obedience. I could probably just stop after mentioning Simonides' famous epigram for the Spartans who fell at Thermopylae, go tell the Spartans that we lie here obedient to their words. But again, we can turn to Herodotus 7104, where Demaratus tells Xerxes that the Spartans see the law as their tyrant. Or Thucydides 184, where this time Archidamus tells the Spartans, we, are too severe, we have too severe a self-control to disobey the laws. One particularly telling classical period example, as will hopefully become clear later, comes from Xenophon's Anabasis, where the exiled Spartan mercenary commander Cleacus tells his troops, you will appreciate that I know as well as anybody in the world how to take orders as well as how to give them. Clearly, Clearchus knew that his men would know that Spartans obeyed orders. And Spartan obedience is a recurring, recurrent theme in later sources like Plutarch. Uh, another Spartan quality, this time a negative one, that appears very frequently in our sources is anger. I noticed in this in particular when gathering data from Plutarch, which you can see on the screen here. For example, in the life of Aristides, Plutarch describes Pausanias jumping up angrily when his ship is rammed by the, uh, by the ships of two um, Ionian uh, commanders. In the life of Agesilaus, he describes Agesilaus as being incensed when the Thebans disrupt his attempt to emulate Agamemnon and sacrifice at Aulus prior to his expedition to Asia. In the life of, 20, like of Agesilaus 28, uh, Plutarch has Agesilaus jumping up angrily uh, when the Theban Epaminondas is besting him in debate. In the Lysander chapter 5, he describes Lysander as incensed when the Athenian officer Antiochus ostentatiously sails past his fleet with only two ships. In, Themist in Themistocles chapter 19, the Spartans are unable to control their anger when Themistocles tricks them. 
In the sayings of the Spartans, the Spartan king Carillus tells a disobedient helot that he would kill him if he were not angry at the time. In the malice of Herodotus, Plutarch complains that Herodotus omitted a story that when uh, Leonidas tried to send one of his kinsmen away as a messenger, his kinsman angrily rejected the commission, stating bluntly that he came to Thermopylae as a fighter, not a messenger. And in the love stories, Plutarch claims that Spartan inability to control their anger was the cause of the devastating earthquake which struck at Sparta in the 460s BCE. These are but a few of many angry Spartans appearing in the pages of Plutarch. I could have given you many, many more examples. And their frequency in Plutarch made me wonder whether Spartan anger, anger might turn out to be a later trope. And indeed, Xenophon in the Hellenica does not portray Lysander as angry when Antiochus is foolhardy enough to sail past his flotilla with only two ships. It's actually a story of Lysander's skills. I also began to speculate whether anger was going to be overrepresented in Plutarch because of the biographical genre. But if we can move on to slide three now, please. One of the things I found quite quickly was that like bravery and obedience, anger, rage, tetchiness, general argument, argumentative behavior are common in the classical period sources for Sparta. We can start straight away with Tatea's fragment 11 again, where he observes that Spartans have felt the rage of painful war and goes on to urge the Spartan fighters to make their anger swell. Herodotus in book 685 describes the Spartans as a group reacting with fury towards the Spartan king Leotokides. In Herodotus' account of the long and bitter argument between Pausanias and Amonferratus prior to the Battle of Plataea, Herodotus has Pausanias tell the, quarrel the quarrelsome Amonferratus that he is mad, the word he uses, minamai, which is the exact term that Xenophon uses to describe how angered Agesilaus was when the Greeks of Asia Minor were paying court to Lysander rather than him. This latter example of classical period Spartan anger seems particularly significant given that Xenophon is usually careful to paint his hero Agesilaus in the best light. One need only think no further than Xenophon's opening to his encomium for Agesilaus, which runs, I know that it is difficult to write an appreciation of Agesilaus that shall be worthy of his virtue and glory. Only a few passages earlier than this, Xenophon has described Agesilaus's angry response when the Thebans interrupted his sacrifice at Aulus, thus showing where Plutarch's earlier, later version comes from. Thucydides in book two has Pausanias tell his lover, ex-lover not to be furious with him when he's tried to have him killed. But perhaps the best example of Spartan anger comes from Xenophon's Anabasis. Xenophon observes that Clearchus often punished in anger, and he describes a detailed episode where Clearchus lost his temper quite spectacularly because one of his fellow mercenary commanders was not sufficiently supportive after he had been almost stoned to death by men commanded by another Greek mercenary commander. And what I'd like to do now is focus on a few of these episodes of Spartan anger in a little bit more detail. And the first one is the episode in Xenophon on Agesilaus and Lysander. If we can have the next slide, please. I've got a bunch of text there that you can be entertained with while I'm speaking. Xenophon, who, as I've already said, is normally keen to show Agesilaus' good side, states bluntly that Agesilaus was maddened by the attention that Lysander was receiving from the leading statesmen of Asia Minor. He was not alone in his anger. The 30 Spartiates who had accompanied Agesilaus to Asia Minor as advisors were also angry, and they rounded on Agesilaus to complain about Lysander's behaviour. But the angry Agesilaus did not show his anger to Lysander. Rather, he set about subtly humiliating Lysander by sending away his clients empty-handed. Xenophon reports that Lysander soon became so distressed which you could think of as perilously close to angry and his dishonor, that he asked Agesilaus to send him away so that he could no longer be, be obviously shamed by being shown to have no influence over the king. As, as uh, Xenophon describes it here, Lysander essentially admits that he has been doing the wrong thing, 
But by adding that he feels his crime is no worse, or is only slightly worse than that of Agesilaus, he makes it clear that he thinks Agesilaus has been wrong too. Unsurprisingly, this episode does not appear in Xenophon's encomium to Agesilaus, but it does appear in Plutarch's Lives of Agesilaus and Lysander. In his Life of Lysander, Plutarch states that Agesilaus felt such ill will and envy towards Lysander that he set about undermining him. As in Xenophon's account, Lysander admits that his behaviour has been no means correct, but also censures Agesilaus for his angry mistreatment of him. Plutarch provides a very different picture in his life of Agesilaus. There are others in, this, in that life, the other Spartans are angry at Lysander's elevated status, but Plutarch says Agesilaus did not bear ill will towards, uh, towards Lysander. Nonetheless, the not at all angry Agesilaus set about under, undermining Lysander out of his natural, as Plutarch puts it, love of strife, uh, which sounds actually quite angry to me, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, if we could move on to uh, slide five. Uh, the term that Agesilaus uses to describe, uh, sorry, the term that Plutarch uses to describe Agesilaus' love of strife is love of Nikos. Uh, and this has relevance when we move on to the next episode of Angry Spartans. And that is um, the quarrel that Herodotus describes between Pausanias and Amonferratus prior to the Battle of Plataea. Herodotus uses the noun strife or wrangling, Nicaea, and the verb Nicaeo to describe their clearly long and heated exchange. The Little and Scott uh, lexicon even cites this Herodotian passage as the primary example of uh, Nicaea, meaning words of strife, railing and abuse. Herodotus reports that the quarrel broke out because all the Spartan captains, except for Amonferratus, had obeyed Pausanias' orders to withdraw. But that Amonferratus refused because he did not want to bring shame on Sparta by fleeing. His refusal to obey orders and made Pausanias and his, uh, and his senior officer, his cousin Euryanax, fearsome. The term is Dinos. And they were made even more fearsome by the fact that his refusal to, to depart would force them to ab abandon the men that he commanded. The wording used here certainly sounds like Pausanias and Euryanax are angry, and modern translations often treat the term Dinos here as meaning anger. Pausanias and Euryanax then try to console or soothe the outraged Demonferratus. The term uh, paragoreo certainly sounds like the soothing of an angry man. But during the course of their wrangling, Amonferratus picks up a stone and hurls it to the ground, prompting Pausanias to describe him as mad. And we have the recurrence of the term minamai again. Herodotus also makes it clear that this angry exchange continued overnight and into the next day. Clearly, this is a very angry exchange. Plutarch also describes it, and then this is where things get slightly interesting when we think about Plutarch and his potential distortion of earlier events. Plutarch goes against what Herodotus tells us and actually ex explains Pausanias's failure to link up properly with his Greek allies, which is a fundamental part of the Battle of, the, uh, Battle of Plataea that follows the next day, to his rage at Amonferratus for his refusal to, to obey orders. So you have Plutarch inserting an extra episode of rage into an already angry exchange. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, the final episode, from the classical period sources that I want to look at here is uh, Clearchus's fury in Xenophon's Anabasis, which is on the next slide. Uh, according to Xenophon, when Clearchus was attacked by the mercenaries commanded by Mino of Thessaly, he called his own men to arms and advanced on Mino's forces with 40 or so Thracian horsemen. When Proxen Proxenos, the Theban uh, mercenary commander, intervened, Clearchus was angry with him because Proxenos was talking mildly about what had happened to him when he'd only just escaped being stoned to death. 
The angry Clearchus orders Proxenos out of the way and is hell bent on attacking, um, attacking Nino's men. But at that point, Cyrus the Younger, the real commander appears on the scene and rides between the two groups of troops and reprimands both captains. Xenophon observes that these words from Cyrus brought Clearchus back to his sense. The word he uses is actually literally, he became himself again. This passage and the description of the anger and Xenophon's later characterization of Clearchus as devoted to warfare, uh, his harsh temperament, his sometimes brutal punishment, and his very obvious tendency to anger has led Lawrence Tritel to speculate that Clearchus suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. This is an analysis that has met with some favor. Following Tritel's work, Robin Waterfield observed, Spartan officers were notoriously harsh disciplinarians, but in Clearchus's case, Spartan harshness may have been compounded by a less controllable factor. By that he means PTSD. Waterfield observes that PTSD victims can become enamored of violence, are constantly ready for it, seek it out and expose themselves to it, which certainly matches with Xenophon's characterization of Clearchus as a lover of war to the utmost extent, which is how he words it. But this analysis of uh, Clearchus as a victim of post-traumatic stress disorder is not without controversy. Indeed, in his review of the volume in which the original study of Clearchus was published, Simon Goldhill bluntly criticised what he perceived as oversimplification and distortion of the primary sources. Goldhill also argued against the idea that ancient hoplite combat would have had the kind of negative social, so, so I'll try that again, would have had the kind of negative psychological impact of modern warfare, arguing, and I quote here, the expectation and familiarity of warfare, which is so important a part of the acculturation of the Athenian and Spartan man, must change the nature and expectation of war. More recently, Jason Crowley has mounted similar arguments, suggesting that Greek hoplites would have been, and I quote, profoundly protected against combat stress injury or PTSD. Now, I don't want to go down that particular rabbit hole tonight, but I will note that Tritel himself recognised that a potential flaw in his analysis of Clearchus's behaviour was the difficulty in explaining why Clearchus in particular ended up more psychologically damaged by warfare than any other Spartans who would have been involved in similar amounts of warfare. And I think there is a potential solution here. Rather than focusing on the danger to Clearchus's life that Tritel homes in on, I'd like to draw your attention to what actually brings out Clearchus's fury. He's angered not that his life has been in danger, he's angered because Proxenos is speaking mildly about the threat to his life. That is, Clearchus loses his temper because Pro Proxenos is not taking him sufficiently seriously. To put it another way, Clearchus gets mad because Pro Proxenos makes him feel like he's being made to look foolish i.e. Proxenos has inadvertently shamed or embarrassed Clearchus. In his analysis of shame and embarrassment, the sociologist Thomas Sheff observes that a common subconscious way of hiding shame, embarrassment or humiliation is to become angry. What Sheff calls shame rage sequences or shame rage spirals. We can see this in Clearchus's behaviour. And we can see a similar pattern in response to disrespect or embarrassment in many of the other examples of Spartan anger that we've looked at. For example, Pausanias, a young untried general, loses his temper when Amonferratus disobeys a direct order. Pausanias, a now slightly older but now very successful general, jumps up in a rage when he is disrespected by his Ionian subordinates. Lysander, a new untried commander, is enraged when the Athenian shows so little respect that he sails past Lysander's fleet with only two ships. Agesilaus, a new commander, loses his temper when the Thebans thwart his ambitions to emulate Agamemnon by sacrificing an Aulos. A few months later, Agesilaus, a new king, loses his temper when he is being embarrassed by Lysander, his former lover, and Lysander grumbles in turn when he is dishonoured and shamed by Agesilaus, his former protege. 
And finally, Agesilaus, a man known for his hatred of Thebes, loses his temper with Epaminondas when the Theban humiliates him in a debate. In each case, we can see an example of a Spartan not being taken as seriously as he would like to be, not being shown due respect, and being made to feel bad about himself, reacting with white hot anger. According to Chef, such shame rage sequences can be one off events, but they can also be more, lot more of a long term problem. Chef observes when anger has its source in feelings of rejection or inadequacy, and when the latter feelings are not acknowledged, a continuous spiral of shame and anger may result. Rather than expressing or discharging one's shame, it is masked by rage and aggression. And this loop may be the emotional basis of lengthy episodes or even lifelong hatred and anger. This, I think, has some relevance when we think of Xenophon's characterization of Clearchus as too fond of war and Plutarch's characterization of Agesilaus as fond of strife. Could we see their reputations for anger and argumenta argumentation and strife as a result of unacknowledged shame? Clearchus must have suffered considerable emotional harm after being permanently excluded from Sparta and the company of his fellow homoio. And Agesilaus clearly suffered regular humiliations due to his physical impairments in a society well known for its emphasis on physical perfection. I could say more, but there really isn't time now. Uh, if we can move on to the, uh, the, the next slide, please. To conclude, I want to focus on one last late source, Diogenes Laetius on Chilon, the 6th century Spartan sage. One of Chilon's famous aphorisms was control anger. The characterization of the Spartans I have outlined tonight suggests that many Spartans would have done well to heed Chilon's warning. Another of Chilon's aphorisms seems particularly apt. When asked what is difficult, Chilon gave a threefold answer. One, to keep a secret unspoken. Two, to employ leisure well. And three, to be able to bear being wronged. All of those qualities seem very appropriate for Sparta. But the idea that bearing being wronged and controlling anger was concerns that Chilon had perhaps suggests that the Spartans had a particular problem controlling their anger when they were being wronged by others. Uh, and if we can move on to the very last slide, please, I will just say, well, that's coming up. Thank you for listening. Uh, and I turn you over to Chrysanthi and Mayor Dukas. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for such an enlightening uh, talk. I found really interesting what you said, uh, Andrew, about emotions in the Spartans, because very frequently um, we read like in advertisements like uh, Spartan race or uh, in uh, quotes from the US Marines about uh, uh, things like a Spartan masters their emotions and um, emotion was an anathema in, in ancient Sparta. So I think your um, uh, I believe your your talk today just uh, goes against these stereotypes and it was really interesting to have uh, a talk which addresses these issues <clears throat> because in general emotions are so understudied uh, in ancient history and uh, I think uh, this is uh, this adds a lot of value in the study of ancient Sparta and uh, thank you so much about for this very interesting um, uh, uh, talk. Matt, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chrysanthi. We've got uh, questions coming in now, so if there's anything you'd like to ask, do type it in the Q&A and I will do my best to ask it for you. Um, so we had one question very early on, uh, which is that in pop culture, uh, Sparta is sometimes very closely associated with Ares, uh, who in turn is often depicted as the kind of antagonist, they're cruel and angry. Uh, they give examples of uh, Riordan's Percy Jackson tr trilogy and Disney's Hercules. Uh, does this reflect, amplify or completely fabricate uh, the relationship between Ares and ancient Sparta? I, I think it's 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 um, reading more in there than there should be. So if you asked me um, which which god do the Spartans really orient themselves, themselves towards, I'd say Apollo. Uh, as in the ideal youth, the uh, the 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 sort of much more thinking 
martial god in that way. So so no, I, I wouldn't see a strong connection between Sparta and, and Ares. I'd see it much more as um, Ares represents what they're not after. Uh, they are trying to control their anger. I just think they're not very good at it. Uh, so so I, th I think that is a, a popular culture wanting Spartans to be associated with Ares because he's the war god rather than what the primary sources tell us. Right. Excellent. Uh, so we have another question in here now. Uh, obviously, it is very early in your project, uh, but it might be an interesting question to wonder whether these sources depict Spartan ang anger more frequently than they do the anger of other Greeks. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, that's if I'd had more time to talk, I would have said the obvious thing to think about is and the obvious extension to this is particularly with an author like Plutarch is to think are the Athenians more angry or equally angry? Um, and, and that's something that is in the back of my mind uh, to do. But at the moment, I'm focusing on the Spartans, but that's that's definitely not something I haven't thought of. <laughs> Excellent, uh, that would be very interesting, I'm sure. Uh, another question here, do we see any sort of chronological change? Uh, so are the Spartans getting more angry or less angry in certain periods? Uh, not from what I've seen thus far, no. Uh, but it's it's what's where I'm going to go ultimately at the end and see how different Plutarch and the later sources are in that way. Whether there is a preponderance of anger in those later sources, but I'm not seeing it yet. Another question, just in. Uh, you mentioned that the Spartans, in particular, had problems controlling their anger when they've been wronged. Mm -hmm. uh, again, do you think that this is a, a commonality among Greek polis or is this more apparent in some than others? Uh, perhaps I could extend that to say are they otherwise pretty universally respected <laughs> and so might be expected to lose their temper when they're disrespected so. Right I think the the interesting question will be is whether this is something that you could say about Athenians, Thebans and Corinthians and so on as well which would be the five years time version of this project. Uh, I think my gut instinct is, is that the Spartans are going to be more sensitive about this. I think that's what's coming out in the in the source material and I think because they are a society that is very secure in their place in the world. Uh, they call themselves the equals. They know they're better than everyone else in their own mindset. I think when they're in the outside world and people aren't respecting them, they're inclined to get angry about it because it's it's they're not used to it, I think would be maybe a way of thinking about it. There are a couple of instances that uh, come to mind where we hear quite specifically that the Spart a Spartan is not angry about something. Yeah. Uh, in light of what you've said, does this mean that we might have expected them to be angry in this situation? Um, well, the thing I'm thinking there is, is a Gesalaius not being angry when in the life of a Gesalaius, but he is angry in the life of Lysander. And I think, I think that's probably Plutarch distorting it to make a Gesalaius look good that he's not angry when he clearly is being painted as angry in the other sources. So uh, yeah, I, I think I'd like I need more more examples before I can say more on that one. I think. Okay, no problem. Um, I think we often think of anger as being quite a negative emotion. Are there examples of anger being more positively framed or perhaps even just justified in certain situations? One of the things I didn't have time to talk about was the concept of what um, Chef calls pure anger. Uh, and and so he makes a, distinguish, a distinction between the, the shame anger and anger when it's actually right. Uh, and it's where it's sort of what you could sort of call it righteous indignation. And I wondered whether we could actually think about Amonferratus's response in that way. Is he angry because he knows he's right? Um, there is a there is a there is a shame context in that one there that he's angry at the idea that Sparta will be made to look ashamed, will, will incur shame from the retreat. But I think his his anger does appear slightly different from the other examples because it's not about him; it's about Sparta that he's getting angry. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. At last, at last. <laughs> uh, uh, do, do you have a question, Mr. Mayor? Uh, should we go to you? Uh, I have a couple. First of all, I need to congratulate the team Nottingham and uh, Chrysanthi for your great work and Andrew for your super presentation. 
we're quite impressed and quite uh, grateful uh, for what you've been doing on Spartan Anger and the whole Nottingham uh, series, which has been a tremendous uh, success. Uh, one interesting uh, question possibly for you, Andrew. Um, obviously, Spartans were humans and they were trained well, but they were humans that had, you know, the human vices and anger uh, was one of them, but not too frequent. I mean, it's uh, it's the kind of thing that you spot, oh, he was angry where he's not supposed to be. So the, the, the main thing was not to be angry. The question is, Spartan policy was governed by anger, like sometimes Athenian policy once uh, when they said, OK, go massacre uh, the guys in uh, Mytilene or all of a sudden the people get pissed off with something and as a whole they got angry. In Sparta, you may have some angry persons for valid reasons, but Spartan international and geopolitics were not seem able to be governed by anger. Even the Peloponnesian War, I mean, the king said, keep cool, guys. Uh, whereas the Nelaidas therefore said, we had enough of these Athenians all the time. And still, they didn't declare war. They just declared null and void the peace treaty. So they seem to be, they had institutions and they kept their self calm. And of course, people in anger were anger. But they didn't do, let's say, a massacre because of anger. It wasn't like Alexander the Great, where he sometimes got pissed off and killed one of his very close friends and generals. In Sparta, people may have anger with a couple of words, and that was about it. And in foreign policy, and this is the question, uh, was it ever governed by anger, or was it typically foreign policy as a coolly perceived, maybe rightly or wrong, but in a cool sense uh, perceived as the best for Sparta? I hadn't thought about it properly yet, but I think the majority of the examples that I'm finding of anger are individuals rather than the people of Sparta. And probably the only foreign policy anger example I can think of thus far is the Themistocles one where, uh, where the Spartans were angry at Themistocles, but it didn't lead to a rupture with Athens. It led to them quietly grumbling to themselves. Uh, so, so I think, yeah, that is that is something I should think about more. Is about how much heat of the moment decisions impact what Sparta does, because I think that is an important question. Because the Athenians are quite good at succumbing to mass anger. Uh, yes. The Spartan institutions are set up very differently, so maybe it, they are less likely to go down a very dangerous route in a hurry. So that's that's an important uh, question. I'm going to maybe their public that. training, the free public training, which was the first ever in uh, the history of uh, history of humankind. Maybe they were taught, you know, figure out solutions for the benefit of the city and not be angry for your own causes and uh, reasons. Or maybe, maybe that had to do something that you have to keep yourself calm because the city needs to, to keep self and calm and not uh, struggle for your personal benefit or for whatever personal reasons you may have or grudges against some others. So many thanks for that uh, excellent research you've done. Thank you. OK, I think we uh, we might have time for just one last question and then I'll throw back to people to, to close up. Uh, so. How does the uh, presentation of anger in the textual sources that we've looked at today map onto other types of sources? Is, are there any artistic presentations of Spartan anger? I hadn't thought about that yet. Uh, so um, so that's, there's, there's, there is that comparatively limited amount of in, like, depictions of Spartans, but I, I should look for, look for iconography of angry Spartans. Um, of a popular culture thing. I was tempted to start with an image from 300 of uh, <laughs> Leonidas kicking uh, the ambassador down a well, but uh, I can't think of any pictorial examples, but I'll, I'm making a note of that. That's a good question. OK, uh, wonderful. I think uh, that's probably all the time I have here for questions, so I shall uh, throw back over to Mayor Dukas. Uh, again, many thanks for all the Nottingham people for the great work that you have done. We expect you post-COVID to come and visit our uh, beautiful country and our beautiful region. A quick reminder that there were a lot of firsts in Sparta for the whole humankind. 
the first to develop a democracy 200 years before Athens, the first to develop a republican system of checks and balances. It wasn't just a straight democracy, let's meet and decide what we're going to do, but there were a lot of filters. The first place in humankind with a constitutional monarchy, uh, where the uh, kings had limits to their power. The first ever land redistribution scheme to develop equality among citizens things that were unheard of uh, before. The first ever city to develop a Senate. The Roman Senate and the American Senate are uh, all their origins to Lycurgus uh, Senate. The first to develop free public uh, education. And the idea of an Olympic truce that while we're holding the Olympic Games, we have to have an international truce. That was also of Spartan origin. So it was much more than Thermopylae and Leonidas and the 300 and that super sacrifice. They were kids and uh, progenies of that uh, system that uh, seemed to have worked uh, for six centuries unabated. For the first time in history, they had a succession of kings and systems that was very peaceful. Typically, you had a Roman Empire that lasted for a thousand years, but the next emperor virtually had to kill the first emperor and had no other relationship to him. In Sparta, you had this system that lasted for 600 years, unabated and without internal strife. So it's something that uh, really, really magnificent. And really thank you again, Chrysanthi, and uh, all your friends for what you have been doing. And, uh, uh, Professor Andrew, really, really, we're grateful for what you're doing. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, it remains then to me to say thank you to um, to Andrew for a very engaging talk. Uh, thank you very much to Mayor Dukas and uh, also the City of Sparta for supporting and uh, uh, co-hosting the series. I would also like to warmly thank um, uh, Associate Professor Hannah Regan. Uh, my dear colleague from the Department of Classics and Archaeology and our IT officer, uh, Terry Wilmer from the University for taking care of the technical part of the webinar. And uh, we um, were really sorry that we experienced these uh, technical issues at the beginning. Uh, many thanks are owed to Matt for handling the Q&A session and uh, to uh, the University for supporting us. Uh, finally, yet importantly, I would like to thank all of you who attended the webinar today. Uh, we look forward to welcome, uh, welcoming you uh, again in uh, uh, three weeks time for another Sparta Live webinar, this time on music in ancient Sparta with Dr. James Lloyd of the University of Reading and with a live uh, demonstration of how Spartan music would have sounded. Uh, so we'll see you uh, again in three uh, weeks time. But in the meantime, why don't you also join us on November 5th for our third Human Past webinar on the topic of bodies, spaces and memory in archaeology with uh, uh, my colleagues uh, Holly Miller and Christopher King, which is organized by our Department of Classics and Archaeology. So uh, thank you to everyone for attending and uh, goodbye for now and stay safe. Αγαπημένοι μας φίλοι, γεια σας και να είστε καλά. Γεια σας όλους, bye bye and thank you.